Welcome back to part two of the lecture in which we're going to be discussing histories of ideas about reality and virtuality. So let's get going. It's interesting to think about the origin of words because often within a word you can find its historical connotations. So it's worth pausing over the word virtual for us to understand how historically people used to think about the difference between the real and the virtual. And we're going to spend a little bit of time doing that today because I think we'll get a bigger understanding about why our understanding of virtual reality can be so confusing. Now, the meanings of words can change over time, and so therefore the history of words can reveal a lot about historical ideas and concepts. One of my favorite things to do is to look up words in the online etymological dictionary, not to be confused with entomological things. Entomology is the history of insects, and etymology is the history of words. There's a lot of free online etymological dictionaries, and they show you how the connotations of words change over time and place, which we discussed last week. But they also show that over time, gradually, these connotations can dislodge even the denotation, the actual received dictionary definition of a, of a word. And that's exactly what's happened with the word virtual. Now, the kernel of the word virtual is hidden inside it. It's virtue. So the virtual was once seen as not the less real, as we might think of it now, but in fact, historically, it was thought of as the better than real. And let's just think about how we got there. So if you look up the word virtual in an online etymological dictionary, as I've demonstrated here, this is one of my favorite tools at, at etymonline.com. It tells us in the late 14th century, it meant influencing by physical virtues or capabilities, effective with respect to inherent natural qualities from the medieval Latin word virtualis and from the Latin virtus, excellence, potency, efficacy, literally manliness and manhood. And then it shifted to being something in essence or effect, though no, not actually in fact. And that was a slight shift in about the mid-15th mid century, uh, probably via a sense of capable of producing a certain effect. And it's not until 1959 that we get this computer sense of the word that we recognize now, not physically existing, but made to appear through software. So that's a lot that's been packed into this word virtual, and it's shifted profoundly over time. So I want to go back to some of these very early definitions then. Prior to the, the 15th century, it had this really strange thing. And often when I look at the history of words, it's the, it's the things that stick out as really odd that I tend to not gloss over, but spend a bit more time thinking about. And here we get that it said it literally meant manliness or manhood or potency. And that's a weird one. But it also meant influencing by physical virtues. Um, so something to do with virtue and something to do with potency and power. And so this is the meaning that we have that kind of stabilizes from early Latin until the um, early to middle, middle ages. How do we get that? Well, <laughs> it's the potency and the manliness that's really interesting about the history of this word. This is a sketch by Michelangelo in the 1400s, just before we're getting the shift of this word to mean something um, to do with not in, um, not in actuality, but um, kind of fake, right? Before that, we get the, the idea that this is where power comes from. Now, the, um, the Greeks and the Romans had a very different idea of potency and of um, virility than we do now. And, and the idea of conception is also related to this idea of thought, right? You, can, can, you have a conception, you have an idea of something. You conceive something, you conceive a baby. And you can see in this sketch by Michelangelo of copulation exactly where they got this idea from because they have this spinal cord basically encasing the central nervous system an electrical um, set of cords sending signals all the way from the brain, all the way down through this encased spine, through these organs into the woman. And indeed, this was the idea um, that a man's potency 
that it was um, the seat of it was in the mind, remembering that the Greeks revered the mind so much, and they thought in the great chain of being that man was just under God, um, believing for a lo very long time from the Greek period until the early Middle Ages in this great chain of being, the idea that thought came from God and that therefore the conception of a human being came from thought and came all the way down the spinal cord into a woman and therefore a progeny, a child was the copy of a man. This was the idea of, of the history of semen. And if you're interested in this more, there's a book I reviewed in 2008 called Images of Bliss, which basically tells you the historical ideas about, um, about male virtue and its, its relationship to semen. And um, you can see here that in the history of the word virtual, then we have this hidden kernel of the word virtue, um, which is related to this idea of the ideal, that um, the ideal is that that comes from above, comes from the heavenlies to the head and enters the world. Now that's truly a very platonic thought, right? That there is a ideal world somewhere out there, perhaps in the heavenlies, that we can perhaps begin to reach for um, and channel in some way. When we talked about Plato last week as having um, the platonic ideal, that there's a sort of bank of ideal images and ideal thoughts floating somewhere around in the ether that we access through thought by conceiving things, that's where we get this notion. So indeed, through Platonic thought and through the history of Greek thinking, philosophers were far more interested in the ideal, the, the most virtuous rather than the real, which was in their mind a more reduced form of existence. And Plato was very worried about mob democracy. He was very worried about the idea that people who didn't um, represent virtue could somehow co-opt the state if they were not given the proper education. Um, and he wanted to ensure that his ideal republic would be um, not only preserved, but find its fullest life. And, and so he thought through this idea of this virtuous or ideal reality, and he began to think about how he could explain it to the common person who he felt was more interested in, in just, you know, the, the riffraff of everyday life and really perhaps was um, in danger of not being able to kind of bring their virtue into society um, to ensure that the Republic had its best chance of um, prosperity. So in um, a very famous allegory that um, Plato came up with, he worked through these ideas in terms of an ideal um, versus a lower real to try to explain to people how he thought there was a higher reality that most people were ignorant of. And um, just to remind you, if you can't remember what an allegory is, an allegory is a story um, that, you know, says one thing, but it really has a higher meaning. It symbolizes something richer or deeper. It's kind of like an extended metaphor. And this allegory of the cave of Plato's suggests that what we take for here and now is not the ideal reality, but something that has duped us or tricked us um, into settling for a lower form of reality rather than trying to reach for this higher form of virtue, the virtuous reality, the virtual reality. So we came up with this allegory around 300 BC. Um, and in it, you can see in the picture here, he says that people are like their prisoners and they are um, chained together in a cave and they are looking at a wall and behind them is a fire and they have been there all of their lives. Um, and there are actually um, behind them in the outside of the cave, there are puppeteers who perform. So the light catches the shadows of the actual external world and casts it almost like an early movie theater upon the walls of the cave. And these prisoners who don't really know that they're imprisoned watch this all of the time and they settle for these images on the cave as if they are reality. Now, in some ways we could say that Plato's allegory of the cave is incredibly prescient. It's forward looking. It's like he almost imagined one day that there really would be movies or that we would be living in a world filled with mediated images that we accepted for reality.
but he's writing thousands of years before that was the case. But um, now this allegory or extended metaphor or analogy or, or, pal or parable is being used by Plato in this case to um, elaborate and teach a concept. Uh, in this case, the cave allegory is, de is devised by the philosopher to ruminate on the nature of shared belief versus what he believed was the higher, more actual, um, more worthwhile reality. And the allegory um, posits in the end that one prisoner could perhaps through great effort become free and finally turn around and see the fire and realize that the shadows are fake and the prisoner could escape from the cave and discover that there's a whole new world outside that they were previously unaware of. And at first, the freed prisoner would have difficulty adjusting his eyes to the world outside the cave. He'd feel incredibly disoriented as opposed to this dark cave in which he'd lived his whole life. And, and he, might, um, he might ask, Plato says in, in book seven of, of his famous work, A Philosophy of the Republic, will he not fancy that the shadows which he formerly saw are truer than the objects which are now show, shown to him outside the cave? Um, and you can begin to see there's lots of different ways to interpret this allegory. We could interpret the refusal to acknowledge a deeper reality might, for instance, be an analogy of the effect of propaganda on the worldview of the body politic, or it might be interpreted in psychological terms as someone having grown up, for instance, in a dysfunctional family, failing to embrace more functional dynamics, but preferring to go back to what is familiar to them. Or it might also be used to explain the reaction to some to education that stretches and challenges their worldviews when they'd rather return to images. In fact, it can be seen as a, as a kind of forethought, as I said, or a predict, prediction of of a world of, of hyper-reality that accepts signs for things, which we'll get to later on in the lecture. But however, in the allegory, um, as Plato goes on to say, the prisoner would believe um, this outside world is more real than the shadows on the cave. He would come to believe that. And he would finally force himself to return to educate the other prisoners and free them from their limited world of illusion. Um, now, even on his return, he's also um, blinded because his eyes are not accustomed to actual sunlight. And the chained prisoners would see his blindness and believe that they too may be harmed if they left the cave. Um, but you can see um, eventually, if you follow the allegory through, that he you know, tries to get his point across. And some people follow him and are willing to, to follow this crazy you know, philosopher who's come back into the cave and told them about higher ways. But the majority of them don't. And you can see um, that Plato's allegory of the cave has implications for, um, you know, things we've been talking about in previous weeks about the relationship between language and reality. If people are willing to accept symbols for the real, it also has implications for um, a world perhaps governed by media and forms of representation. Um, it has implications for the role of, of education, for example, or other forms of emancipation in trying to penetrate through people's kind of blocked worldviews. And it also has implications for the nature of democracy if most people are not very willing to be educated or think of a deeper reality behind the commonplace reality they see every day. Now this idea of um, the virtual as the ideal reality or the better reality that we can see in Plato's allegory of the cave, as I said, is with us all the way up into the middle um, ages. And, and I want to show you how you can see that even within some of the great cathedrals of this period. Now, cathedrals were places of great ornamentation. They were the movie palaces of, of the so-called Dark Ages because we didn't have electricity. There wasn't a lot of art. There certainly weren't books in a lot of places. So they were places of learning, but also of storytelling and also where these sort of these movies of the mind um, could be projected through beautiful stained glass. Um, and, and through these stained glass images, we can see that people were meant to look up and out and beyond this kind of cave of a cathedral to a heavenly world beyond in ways that very much emulate what Plato is talking about. Now, the um, Holy Roman Empire, um, which was first united by Charlemagne, was a relatively unchallenged power block between the years 800 and 1500. So this is the period in which Europe was hugely united in a way that um, created a power block of Christendom versus the Caliphate versus the Hebrews.
these were religious ways of uniting people um, that were also allied with um, military and economic power under under Charlemagne. And so there was a, a very common shared worldview during this period by many people throughout Europe that life was, as it says in Psalm 84, a journey through a veil of tears of life's tribulations to a heaven beyond. This is still very much a kind of platonic ideal of, you know, this is just a, a dupe here and now. This life here on earth is just temporary. It's a reduced vision of what we can earn in the world beyond. And, and you can see why people would think that. People had, had short life spans. There was lots of disease and poverty. And conditions for the average person were rough enough that um, for Enlightenment philosopher Thomas Hobbes to conclude when he came along in about the 1600s um, that until a more equitable form of government could be formed to dis distribute wealth um, more equally, um, that life for most men was nasty brutish and short. That's a famous quote from his book, The Leviathan. So if the this world on earth and this worldview is a reduced form of a higher um, reality beyond in the heavenlies, you can see the inheritance of Plato going all the way through here into this notion that the virtual isn't a poorer substitute of reality, but is a, a, a better version of reality. It's the ideal now, this is a window um, that comes from the Canterbury Cathedral, um, which was built around the year 597. It's England's perhaps earliest um, cathedral, and it features in one of our earliest works of um, English literature, Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, which captures the pilgrimage to this impressive site of iconography. And now a pilgrimage um, was something people would take because these beautiful palaces were so rare. Um, they were uh, works of devotion, but they were um, stunning works of iconography of the kind that people in this kind of nasty, brutish short life would not be used to seeing. And this is not a world surrounded by TV screens and movies. This is, this is the best you've got. And so people would be like, in my life, if I'm lucky, I might get to this place. Or some people would go there kind of once a year. Um, and this is the image um, that illustrates the story in the Bible when Jesus says, suffer the little children to come unto me, showing that he is somebody who um, who has time for the neglected in society, um, such as children or the elderly or women, for example. So these windows told the stories and they were the best he got for virtual reality back then, but it wasn't virtual as a substitute for reality. It was a higher reality. And this all begins to change when we have changes in um, technology that allow, um, with the advent of the Gutenberg printing press, the um, printing of many, many, many copies of the Bible. And about 100 years after the advent of the printing press, enough uh, widespread uh, literacy for people to be able, even if they're relatively um, common and, and not from a high class background to have access to the Bible and to read it. And this eventually then led to a huge social re revolution and in a way that you could say mirrors our own where we've now had the internet in a you know common way probably for about 20 years. Um, but um, you know many of you may think it's old hat, but I think we're only beginning to see the way that it is changing the landscape of our societies and even um, the way in which nation space um, imagines itself and, and life in nations plays out. And this is exactly, you know, what happened in the time of Luther when in, um, you know, the middle of the 1400s, um, Gutenberg introduced this brand new technology of movable type in a printing press that allowed really, really rapid um, proliferation of lots and lots and lots of copies of Bibles and people could get these in their own hands and read for themselves and, you know, finally um, have access to the so-called word of God themselves, not, not just in Latin, but eventually in their own language, in their own German language and understand things. They no longer needed to go to the source of power, um, the priest, for example, or the bishop um, to be told how things work.
but they could work it out for themselves in what they called the priesthood of all believers. They no longer needed to go to a church to receive teaching. They no longer needed to go and pay, for example, what they called indulgences to the priest to forgive them for their sins when they realized they read the Bible and that was nowhere in there. And this unleashed a very bloody um, revolution that we, we call the Reformation and it sounds very civil. It sounds like it's not a um, revolution at all. It sounds like it's just a, a little bit of a reform program. Um, but in fact, it was a precursor to democratic revolutions that would um, really sweep the world about a, a hundred years later. Um, because across Europe, wars broke out over um, the nature of power, the nature of truth, the nature of reality, questioning what had been taught um, by the people who, who, so you know, so for so long, dominated the grand narrative of of biblical truth and teaching, and they believed now they could read words that they no longer wanted um, cathedrals and churches. Um, filled with these icons anymore, which once had been seen as the portal to a higher world, but now were seen as falsehoods, as imagery that was adornment and that was misleading. Um, and they wanted simply the bare information, the bare truth. And so there were both civil and uncivil um, campaigns to, to just rid churches of all of that um, adornment and iconography, um, destroying all of these image ideals. Now, this was um, a revolution that was really set off by Martin Luther, who in the mid-1500s nailed 95 theses to a door of a church in Wittenberg and, um, and said, you know, these are the, the 95 things that are basically wrong with the way in which Christianity is being taught to us now. And I encourage you to have a look at this video because it explains it in, in a more lucid way than I probably have. Um, what the the Reformation, um, which could not have happened without the printing press, unleashed and how it radically changed the nature of uh, what we believe as being reality. Reality not as something that's higher or more ideal, but something that is here and now and can be accessed by the common person in which people wanted it to be an unadorned truth, um, not something fl with flourished narratives, but something that's really quite bare and simple. So they, this created a series of battles over the nature of the real and the virtual. And um, this is something that Rob Shield ac accounts for us in his famous book, The Virtual, written in 2003, which we have um, e-copies of in the library if you want to look it up through OneSearch. He begins with a history of virtuality and reality himself and says, do you think that there's anything new about the virtual? If so, you'll be surprised to learn that in 1556, Thomas Cranmer was executed in large part because of his affirmation of the virtuality of the Eucharist. Now you can see the way that this was related to some of the debates um, that were being unleashed by Martin Luther's 95 Theses and the revolutionary ransackings of churches that were happening in the Reformation. Now, for most of you, you probably don't know what the Eucharist is, but the Eucharist is when um, people take a piece of bread or cracker these days and some wine in a church service. And it comes from the Last Supper when Jesus is sitting with his disciples around the table and he is telling them in ways they don't understand yet that he is about to die and that he will not be with them for very much longer. But in order to comfort them, he holds up the wine and he says, you know, after I'm gone, basically, you can take this cup and this is my, this is, this wine is my blood and take this bread and this is my body and it will be broken for you. And this was, this is the Eucharist so that the people um, still participate in today by drinking the wine, the blood of Christ and eating the bread, the body of Christ. They believe that they can be united with Christ, that he will be returned to him. And um, there were debates about this in the 1500s, about whether this was actually the blood of Christ and actually um, the body of Christ, or whether it was simply symbolic. And as we're turning into, a, in an, into an age that is a precursor to the Enlightenment, the period of the emergence of um, humanism and then empiricism and science and logic, you can see that people are like, it's just not logical. This really, like it, it came from grapes, and I know that a priest blessed them, but this is like 
it's juice, guys. It's not blood. Um, and this was seen as heresy. It was seen as you're not really a believer then. If you're saying that this thing that we've actually sanctified from above and channeled through a priest, the power of the living Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ into this cup, and you're denying that that's happening, well, you're going to lose your life over it. The, the, these were battles over the nature of reality and virtuality. And they were seen as high stakes as much as they may seem laughable to us now. And many um, sects of Christianity actually still have this sense of they've decided, no, it's real, it's not symbolic, and it becomes real when it's blessed by the priest. And um, so much so that they're not allowed to waste the blood of Christ. So if they pour out extra um, expecting that they're going to have a large congregation to take um, communion that day, you know, to commune with the body and blood of Christ, spirit of Christ, then um, they have to drink and eat the remainder of the bread and wine that's left over um, to the extent that they might even become drunk. Um, but even to this day, some, some parts of Christianity do make their priests do that because they believe that it can't be wasted. It really is real once it's been blessed. Now, we're moving towards the Enlightenment. And now, I don't want you to think that the Enlightenment is right. And prior to the Enlightenment, they were just deluded and in, 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 in the dark. And the words we have for those eras make us think that because they actually encode social beliefs that we've had about these um, periods of history for a very long time, the Dark Ages before they knew things, the Enlightenment when logic came um, to, you know, lay everything bare and show us as they, things as they really are. A lot of people still still think like this. They still think that the Enlightenment brought logic and now we have logic, we know the truth. But I, I do want to problematize that for you in the way that post-structural theorists do do that for us. But I also do want to take a step back before I do that and just show you that we've already visited some theorists such as Elizabeth Eisenstein that are simply looking at technological changes that happen during this time that um, lead to different ways of thinking about the nature of what matters and the nature of reality. So when Elizabeth Eisenstein pointed out that the proliferation of movable type after Gutenberg's press led to a scientific revolution and scientific ways of thinking, which we now largely think of as truth, she was actually saying, you know, this was just a shift in a way of thinking that now we have lots of movable bits we can put into a printing press. It's kind of like these ways that we think about breaking down knowledge into its component bits that we move around and, you know, question and recombine. And, and it's just a different episteme, a different way of thinking. And, um, and this different way of thinking, thinking that, you know, that the scientific way of accessing the real truth and the real truth now is in the here and now, not in the virtual ideal sphere of the heavenlies emerged first out of this new human-centered view of the universe, which was called humanism, um, at which led to empiricism, which simply means um, the practice of gathering information from your senses, forming hypotheses, and subjecting them to tests, such as we do in the scientific method. Um, and, and that's where we get this description of empirical truth. That idea of truth is not focused any longer on the ideal world or on virtue. It's focused on what is in the here and now before us. That here and now, that until this period had been seen as not worthwhile. It was, it was stripped bare. It was nasty, brutish, and short. And what was worth focusing on was the higher sphere. So this really is a profound epistemic shift we see in this period. Um, a switch from the focus on the virtual as ideal from Plato's higher realm or Christendom's heaven um, to the here and now, where the virtual then became, became seen as less valuable than the tangible, less important than what is here and now. And we get virtual shifting in this period of about 1500 to meaning the lesser copy of the real. And it's around this period that we actually begin to develop uh, a notion of what we call positivism and then later on logical positivism. And most people when they come to university, and certainly those people who study the scientists, are probably positivists without even having heard that word or knowing what that means. But positivism was actually a field of, of philosophy or way of thinking that was developed by a social thinker called Auguste Comte. He was often seen as the father of modern day sociology. And he basically said positivism starts with like the things that we can see in front of us and touch um, and measure um, that that's all we can really know. Like forget about these highfalutin ideas that philosophers like to 
you know, bandy around. Those aren't testable ideas. What is truth? Is the testable, measurable, empirical, touchable, seeable here and now? And I think a lot of people, when they struggle with philosophy, say, I don't know why we're getting around, trying to get our heads around these crazy ideas, when really all I just want to work on is the here and now. They have a positivist belief that all there is to, to be seen or known in the world is that which is before their eyes. And that is something that it has been passed down to us through the episteme of the Enlightenment period and which finds itself in the 20th century as a form of what we call logical positivism. Because we, we now have a science that doesn't just focus on the here and now. We have a science that has worked on atomic theories, for example, that has worked on theories through physics of, of the molecule or even of quantum mechanics, for example. And so once we start to get into crazy kind of science like that, um, it becomes a little bit more conceptual than just about touching things and doing experiments that can be measured. They're far more hypothetical. And so scientists kind of stretch that notion of positivism to what they call logical positivism, which is a combination of the things we can see and touch with also a logical set of deductions about that. And again, many people who gravitate towards the sciences believe that between positivism and logical positivism, We've kind of like figured out all we need to see and know and you don't really need to fuss around the edges of these crazy ideas that they study in the arts. But I just want to remind you that we do have uh, a different way of thinking about um, the nature of reality in, our, in the arts. And, and that is what scientists would call from a more constructivist perspective or a post-structural perspective. So I'm reminding you what we talked about last week when we were thinking about narrative and communications, we talked about the nature of signs or semiotics or symbol systems and reality. And we talked about different languages having um, different ways of accessing reality and different representations and ideas of reality encoded in them that they come with sets of beliefs about, well, well the nature of things and um, they have value laden um, notions in them as well. There's a word for that, for that, that way of thinking or that set of symbol thinkings, and it is called an ontology, which is a very fancy way um, of talking about everything that your way of thinking presents to you that is generally shared by your society. I tend to think of um, an ontology as, as kind of like a computer operating system. You might be on a Mac or you might be on a Windows. They've got different operating systems, but it's, it's the code that underpins your way of seeing reality and to a certain extent determines it. So as an example, a very obvious example of that, last week we thought about the song lines and we thought about how Indigenous Australians have a different way of mapping place and understanding their relationship to place produced by a culture that was walking, nomadic, tribal, and oral um, that had relationships to um, significant places um, where sometimes um, s spiritual meanings um, were endowed as well. Um, and that's one way of being on this continent that sees it as one continent, but with many countries um, connected through these song lines and overlapping dreamings. Now I wanna to suggest to you that that is not a primitive way of thinking, but simply an alternative ontology, a different operating system on this continent, right? Then we talked last week about Benedict Anderson's notion that um, the newspaper and the steam, steam train were really important for uniting what were at first the colonies of Australia into a federated nation that extends across a whole continent um, through the distribution of you know, many, many copies of one national word, not necessarily the Bible, but, you know, the daily news where we're reading the same thing and we're on the same page every day. We're under the same powers. Um, we're governed by the same people. We're following the same daily events. And he said those things kind of united us in one continent, in one nation. We get two competing claims to reality here in one space and place. And so I want to suggest to you here that even in the case of Settler Australia, where you have one way of being and then another way of being in the same place that the nation state is only one way of being, one ontology or one mutual conceptual hallucination um, that we all enter into. The state is not a natural thing. It is a constructed thing. 
it is a social thing. Um, and we, we consent to agreeing uh, between us that it exists and it is a place called Australia. And because largely we are, as we talked about before, docile bodies, we don't necessarily um, find out what happens when we disagree with that. But when people do disagree with that, like they don't pay their taxes or um, they protest against um, border closures during the pandemic, for example, um, or lockdowns, they do find the repressive arm of the state coming out um, and affecting their lives. And they are, um, in that case, they find themselves to be less free than they perhaps thought they were um, when they were simply docile. Now, all of this is to take us back to um, the history of virtual and then connect us to the way that it's talked about now after the advent of this term cyberspace. Cyberspace was a term that was coined by science fiction novelist William Gibson in 1984. Science fiction writers have been really important for ideas that we have today about virtual reality and cyberspace. And cy cyberspace, as William Gibson imagined it, was what he called a consensual um, hallucination. But um, I want to suggest to you that there are many conceptual and, and consensual hallucinations that we do subscribe to, um, the nation state being one of them. And um, you can only need to go to the lecture from last week to think about the many different ways that um, language shapes our ideas of reality um, in which we kind of might participate in a sort of consensual hallucination. So this is all to kind of get us to this idea that over time there's been this history of what what is the real and what is the virtual. And it's kind of shifted um, from the time of Plato it was fairly stable um, all the way up into the Middle Ages when the virtual or the higher order reality beyond this ateliated stripped back world that is nasty, brutish and short on earth was the thing that mattered. That was more real than the real. And then that shifted around the time of the Reformation um, when there was a protest against this idea of, you know, idealization and iconography, and it stripped everything back to the very basic and to the book and to the letter of the law. And that then led to um, the uh, scientific revolutions um, that were presaged by the Enlightenment and a focus on logic and positivism and reality being here and now. But I'm flipping that now and reminding you that you know, that is just one way of seeing reality. We've learned last week that, in fact, it's far more complex than that. There are many different ways that we can think about what reality is. And um, the philosopher John Searle has given us some ways to kind of break down perhaps orders of reality, to give, give us a sense of what perhaps scientists and arts theorists are fighting over here when we're talking about these sorts of things. We're not denying the reality of there being soil on the ground in a place that we now call Australia. It's real. That's not a hallucination. But that's the objective part of what we're accessing when we're talking about this continent of Australia. There's also ideas that are associated with nationalism and symbols that are associated with it and laws, for example. So John Searle um, and the philosopher Philip Bray came together to form this theory of social reality where they broke down orders of reality into objectivist versus constructivist components. And they said the, the, the people who only believe in this positivist notion of reality, of, of what can be seen and touched, are mostly people who are concerned with like the physical things of reality. But that's just one order of it. There's also, there are also many constructivist aspects that we walk around with, the kind of operating systems that we have in our brain, our ideas and our notion of the relationships between things. And so they broke it down into there being three different orders of reality, the physical kinds, things we can touch, apples, trees, babies, that's there. Then there's also the functional kinds, you know, things we use to know things. Um, components of measurement like compasses, rulers, and maps. And we talked earlier about how sometimes the functions of those things can be forgotten and we kind of tend to think that they're actual, um, maybe even physical representations of a real reality. And we get these orders sometimes confused, right? And then the third order of reality, they say, is the social kind of reality. They're distinctive, they said, because they are ontologically subjective 
and epistemologically objective or epistemically objective. And those are really fancy words, but they're simply broken down. It means this. Social kinds of reality are, um, are, are interesting <laughs> because they are, are concerned, they are constructivist. They come from ideas, but they actually have um, actual real effects, objective effects in our lives. We can't just walk away from our marriages one day saying, oh, that was just an illusion or I was deluded. I mean, you may do that and find yourself going through a divorce, but you will find that there are real physical and objective effects of that as well. You're going to have to divide property, yada, 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 on and on and on and on, come up with custody plans because this marriage that you had wasn't just a delusion, but it had material effects. The same with money I'm going to talk about later. It's um, material, but we all consensually agree that it holds value, even though it's just paper. But if we rip that paper up, it has um, objective effects in our lives. And if we um, refuse to deal with money, that has subjective effects in our lives as well. Same with citizenship. It is ontologically subjective. We may all mutually, you know, um, have this hallucination that we are all um, subjects of this great country called Australia. Um, but, um, and the nation state is an idea, an ideal, not a reality, but it does have material effects in our lives. Um, we are required to hold passports if we wish to leave the continent of Australia and travel overseas. We are required to remit taxes. We are required to obey the laws of Australia. And if we break them, we find the repressive state apparatus coming out after us. So you can see that it's these third kinds, these social kinds that can be the most confusing because they are constructivist. They are based on culturally specific ideas that sometimes change over time and from culture to culture, but they have material effects. And it's those constructivist notions, those social kinds of realities that those of us who are social scientists or humanists or creative arts scholars find ourselves dabbling in. So we really need to master what we're talking about. Now, let's just revisit this um, book, The Virtual by Rob Shields, because he is giving us a very capacious definition of the word virtuality that kind of encompasses the history I've been giving it in this lecture today. He says, today, the word virtual is often used as a proper noun, the virtual, a place, a space, a whole world of graphical objects and animated personae, which populate fictional, ritual, and digital domains as representations of actual persons and things. Commentators have not failed to remark that these avatars, video game characters, software agents, and virtual objects not only stand in for flesh and blood persons in physical places, but they have significant and shocking impacts on the real life status and well-being of people. However, the more mundane case of virtuality includes lines of code in a database which record and police a person's financial transactions and debts. This credit profile is one's virtual identity for transaction purposes as far as banks and merchants are concerned. So what he's saying is there's lots of different ways in which our everyday life is already virtual, right? Like, you know, we whether we're, we're dealing with paper money or coin money or electronic money, just moving digits around with the swipe of our card in the FPOS machine. We are dealing with simple systems and therefore with a kind of virtual reality, um, a kind of uh, a space and a place that has graphical objects in it that we exchange um, and in sometimes ritualistic ways. Um, and we're not just talking about virtual reality with VR goggles. It's important to get our head around this because when we start thinking about virtual reality with VR goggles, it helps us remember that there are some real questions we need to ask about that um, that relate to the history of, of, of ideas about reality and virtuality. So that now moves us to part three and that's the end of part two. And in part three, we're going to think about how and why some of this matters for, for networks and, and we're going to put some social theory in here as well.